Happy Thanksgiving week. We're going to be talking about manna burgers and roasted quail today. You know, even though Thanksgiving is uh, about food for most of us Americans, it tends not to be a time of culinary adventures. I mean, most of us tend to go for, you know, the tried and true things for Thanksgiving, you know, when it comes to turkey and apple pie or pumpkin pie. Uh, in fact, this last week I heard that uh, someone described how the family gets on their dad for experimenting with new stuff at Thanksgiving. And I found that we're going to have a little bit of new stuff for Thanksgiving this year where we're going for Thanksgiving. But this morning, our biblical account, it's all about food. And it comes to us from the desert wanderings of God's people. You know, wilderness and deserts aren't necessarily places that we look for when it comes to the context of cooking. But, and by the way, I just learned this fun fact, and that is nearly 70% of Bible stories take place in the context of wilderness. Interesting. Uh, but this morning, our scripture text is going to be from Exodus uh, 16, and you can follow along there on 1 through 15. And we're also going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2 and all, with a few other passages in between there. But our, our story this morning, our account this morning, uh, it, it's, it's a creative, some creative Israeli cooks hatched up this dish and, and, and it has to have been called quail a la manna. Uh, I mean, I'm, if you had fast food back then, uh, Hebrews probably, you know, Hebrews fast food restaurants probably didn't have manna burgers, even though Keith Green wrote about them and sang, sang about them. But, you know, you could, if you couldn't get a manna burger, at least you could get roasted quail. And the Hebrew people were on this long march between Egypt and the land of Canaan. And God gives a wonderful experience of, of deliverance from bondage in Egypt. They were walking through the sea, uh, the Red Sea, on dry land, while Pharaoh's army is swallowed up with the water and drowned in, in the Red Sea. They celebrate by singing and, and dancing, and you can read about that in Exodus 15. And the euphoria quickly turns to complaints. The mob of ex-slaves pitched their camp at, at Mara, and, and there, that literally means bitter water, and, and there the waters were bitter, and God intervenes by sweetening the water, the bitter waters. Elam is the next stop, and this is kind of a desert oasis. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, palm trees, blue skies, springs of water. Uh, it, if, if you could imagine... Today, you know, I'm sure they would have had swimming pools and, you know, today it would have a pickleball court and they'd probably have uh, golf courses and gourmet restaurants and all sorts of stuff. It's the Middle East palm, version of Palm Springs, if you can imagine that. It's everything a tired hiker would, would desire. Everything they could ask for is there. But God doesn't let the Hebrew people stay there very long. In fact, they don't stay in the resort of Elam long at all. God moves them into the desert of sin. And I remember Wilbur Fields emphasizing that sin so much as he would talk about that in Old Testament history. It's an ominous sounding word. I mean, what a hard place, the desert of sin, sun, beaten down on everybody. Absolutely no shade in which you could find rest. Water was to be rationed. And worst of all, there was no food. There's an old saying that says an army marches on its stomach. Well, when there's no food, there's not going to be much marching taking place there. And so if you're without food, it's really, really bad news. And pretty soon, from all the, the corners of the Hebrew camp, you could hear these gripe leaders arrive and, and go into action. Instead of cheerleaders, they had gripe leaders. The, the Hebrew gripe leaders, they, they had it, then a chorus of complaints came up because there was murmuring then that would just continue to roll throughout the community. And you'd hear things like, where do these leaders of ours, Moses and Aaron, think they're taking us? 
I mean, look at the wonderful place of Elam. We were just that. Why couldn't we stay there just a little longer? We had everything we needed. Instead, they marched us out to this godforsaken desert where there's no shade, where there's no water, where there's no food. And so the grumbling begins. And you can hear them go and say things like, Man, remember what it was like back in good old Egypt? Where we had to make our own bricks and go get our stubble and straw and all that. Forget about all that. It was still good because there we had, I mean, we had food to eat. It would have been a whole lot better for us to die as slaves in Egypt than to come out here in this desert and, and to die even though we're free, but we starve to death. Moses and Aaron, they brought us out here to starve to death. Down with Moses. Down with Aaron. You realize it's only been about a month? It's only been about a month since the Hebrew people saw God uh, power up and, and just wipe out Egypt with the ten plagues. Egypt, who happened at that time, was the, one of the greatest powers in the world. But in a contest of power against God, God wins hands down. It's only been about a month since the parting of the Red Sea. It's just about a month since that great deliverance. It only takes a month and they start griping and groaning and grumbling. And so God finally spoke through Moses, his, his servant. And he said, all right, all right, I've had it. I've heard all the grumblings already. And actually what Moses said of God in God's behalf was he has heard your grumbling and he says it three times in three verses that one little short sentence he has heard your grumblings and in Exodus 16 then on our text God says in essence if you want food I'm going to give you food and so the next morning all the camp has this heavy dew on the ground and, and there when the dew dries there's this flaky substance that appears on the desert floor, and it's manna. And that's what they said, manna, which means, what is it? <laughs> that's what manna means. What is it? Manna sounds like something a little kid, you put something in front of them they've never seen before, and they're going, manna, what is it? That's what they're asking. And so that word stuck. And who knows what really manna was like? I mean, maybe it, it, it was something like Honey Nut Cheerios, you know? Uh, the, the book of Numbers tells us that, that when they ground it into flour and they made cakes, that, that manna tasted like wafers made with honey. Or it may have, instead of cakes, they may have uh, baked it in oil. And instead uh, of manna burgers, which probably never happened, uh, they had probably manna scones. Whatever it tasted like, manna, you see, was a provision of God. It was God's provision for human hunger. It was sufficient. It was satisfying. Manna was the gracious gift of a good God. Jesus said in, in, in John 6, 48, he said, I am the bread of life. And so Jesus today is manna. Jesus is that satisfying provision. He satisfies our spiritual hunger. He satisfies our spiritual thirst. And back in the wilderness, though, and, and that's where we go again and again every day. So much of human life time is spent in the wilderness. And when God says that he's going to give them manna, that's exactly what they got. They got manna for, for Sunday morning. They got manna Monday morning. They got manna Tuesday morning. All throughout the week, they got manna. They even had so much manna on, on Fridays that they didn't have to worry about getting the manna on Saturday for the Saturday Sabbath. And so they didn't have to collect on that day. I suspect they had manna straight. I'm sure they toasted it. They probably boiled it. They probably, no telling how they did it. Keith Green wrote uh, uh, this song about it. He says, in, in the morning, it's manna hotcakes. We snack on manna all day. And they for sure had, uh, had a winner last night for dinner, flaming manna souffle. And if man is all you get, and you have that every single day, you're likely to get tired of it, aren't you? 
and forget the wonderful blessing that manna really is. And pretty soon the gripe leaders start stirring the pot again. The gripe leaders come out and with a chorus of complaints, who can live on bread alone? Man, oh man, remember when he had that good grub back in Egypt? You know, we, what, what I wouldn't give for some vegetables. Even if it has to be broccoli. <laughs> or for me, it would be hominy. Ugh. In November, or November, if we are in November, in the book of Numbers, <laughs> get it right. In, in the book of Numbers, in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 6, one translation says, now we have lost our appetite, and we never see anything but this manna. Finally, God has said, basically, you want meat? Okay, I'll give you meat. And you'll get meat till you're sick of meat. And you're going to get meat till you can't stand either the manna or the meat. And enter the quails. Small birds that brought to the camp by an east wind. They fly low, they roost on the, right near the ground, on the ground, easy to capture in the morning. They'd take a basket out and swat it. I guess they could just take it out and just scoop them up, you know? And then they would run right back to the tent where the Jewish mamas were there to make up a, a basket full of quail along with their ever-present manna. Quail was, was good for a while. I mean, people really like quail. Quail doesn't taste, I don't know what it tastes like. I've never had quail. I've been told it, you know, it always when they have something like that, they always say, well, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> I don't know. People praise God for the quail. It wasn't long before they start asking questions. Man, quail? Could I get a burger? I mean, or, or maybe some lamb stew? I'll even take some leftover turkey and stuffing, you know. But it was just quail, roasted quail, quail with manna. And then they start grumbling all over again. So why was it that the people of God grumbled? Why was it that the people of God grumbled? Why, why does anyone grumble? Very simply, we, gr we grumble because we forget. Grumbling is forgetfulness. Grumbling, for the Hebrews, was forgetting how bad it was to be a slave in Egypt. They forgot about going out and making their bricks. They forgot about having to gather up the, the straw to make the bricks. They forgot about all of the, the, the quotas that they kept increasing on them. And I, about that. They, they forgot. Grumbling is forgetting how much they wanted out of there. Grumbling is forgetting the, the gracious act of God to, to liberate us from bondage. Grumbling is forgetting God's promises of a new land, not just a land, but their own land. Grumbling is, is taking our eyes off of the hope that is offered to us by God's promises. Grumbling is selective forgetfulness. Remembering only the good things from the past and forgetting the trauma. And you, you hear that. This is, it's like when, when folks are paying for the good old days. They're, they're always, I remember hearing about that more stuff as I was a kid, about people talking about the good old, remember the good old days of the cool, we'd sit outside in the cool, I'm like, in the summertime when it's hot, I don't want to be in air conditioning. That's not the good old days going back, you know. Now, it might be if you're out camping by the river and it's cool in some areas. But for the moment, here in the city, that's not comfort, is it? But that's what it is. They forget the way it used to be. Keith Green, again, has the Hebrew singing a, a rollicking chorus. He's singing, Eat, eating leeks and onions by the Nile. Ooh, what breath. <laughs> Dining out in style. Ooh, my life on the skids. Give me the pyramids. Grumbling is forgetfulness. Maya Angelou, the African-American poet, tells of whiners who would come into her grandmother's store in Arkansas. And her grandma would quietly 
get uh, Maya to come near close when she would have these particular customers come in the store and she kind of baited them with a question like, how are you doing today, Brother Thomas? Or how are you doing today, sister, or whatever? And then the person would just gush into complaining. And as she would listen to them talk, she would try to make sure that Maya was paying attention getting really close and then after they left she would have her stand in front of her and then she said if she did this a thousand times she would have her repeat exactly what these people complained about she said you know did you hear what sister so-and-so said or what you know brother so-and-so was complaining about and Maya would shake her head yes and then the grandma would say sister to her there are people who went to sleep all over the world last night. Poor people, rich people, white people, black people, and they never wake up again. Those expected to rise did not. And those dead folk are going to not, they would give anything if they could just have five more minutes of this weather, five more minutes of, of this plowing. And the person, whatever it was they were grumbling about, and her grandmother would say, you watch yourself. Watch yourself about complaining. And then the grandma would conclude, she'd say, what you're supposed to do when you don't like things that they are is change it. And if you can't change it, change the way you think about it, but don't complain. Grumbling is forgetting the blessing of life itself. Grumbling is forgetting life's simple benefits. See, grumbling can become a habit. And we can make it a habit, uh, uh, you know, of ignoring or forgetting what God has blessed us with, of God's goodness. When I, the summer before I went to college to play football at the University of Tulsa, I worked at a culvert pipe plant in Springfield. We made corrugated whistle pipes. You know, it went and actually all the pipe that we made is down at Silver Dollar City. You know, all those parking lots for the drains underneath. What an inspirational work. I remember though spending a lot of hours punching holes in corrugated cans of steel and then uh, putting rivets in those uh, you know, in those holes, and then they would be punched again. So it was a three-step process kind of a thing. They had, you know, and we would try to spin it down to two. And it wasn't something I had to think an awful lot about other than keeping my hands out of the punch because that was my job, holding the can and then putting the rivets in. And, and they would be greasy and oily and slippery, so you know, can imagine what it would be like. But I could think about other things while we were doing this. When I went to the factory every day, I noticed that about most everybody there showed up about three quarters of an hour to an hour early. And they came together, they sat around a table, and they smoked, and they uh, uh, would complain about the work. See, grumbling had become a habit. Uh, it was a lifestyle of forgetting. They, weren't, they forgot that they had a job. A man and his teenage son were on a fishing trip several miles from home, so they ad attended a church worship service at a rural church near where their fish camp was. And as they were walking back to the car after the service, the, the father was just filled with complaints. He was like, man, that service was way too long, that sermon was boring, and that song service was way off key. And finally the young boy said to his, he said, Dad, I thought it was pretty good for the dollar you put in the plate. <laughs> Paul writes to the believers in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Do all things without murmuring. Some translations say complaining. Uh, Paul uses the same word that's found in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The word found is in, in, in the account here of the grumbling Hebrews. Is, it's the word that sounds an awful lot like murmuring, but the word is gongamos. Sounds like grumbling to me. <laughs> I mean, doesn't it? it, it but it's, it's the, like very close to our English word of murmuring. He says, do all things without gongamos. Do all things without murmuring. See, for grumbling, 
is forgetting. And that, that not only goes with our relationship with God, but it goes with our relationship with one another. And oftentimes I, I, I murmur about people that I know or have known or maybe are close to me and I, I, I forget the good things that they've brought to my life and I focus on that one maybe negative situation or circumstance or comment or whatever. And one reason we have the stories and the accounts that we have of, in the Bible that are written down for us is to help us not to forget. It's to help us to remember. And in fact, Moses was instructed to take some manna and he was to put it in the Holy of Holies. And it was there for safekeeping because it was to be that ongoing reminder to the people of God's goodness, of God's provision. So grumbling is forgetfulness. But let's flip the coin and let's look at the other side of grumbling. While grumbling is forgiveness, thanksgiving is a response to grace. You know, the Exodus was the gracious act of a good and compassionate God. The Hebrews hadn't earned God's goodness. I mean, they actually had forgotten God. They forgot the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and so while they are, especially while they were suffering under Pharaoh's hand, but God remembered his covenant with their fathers, their ancestors, and, and he delivered them from slavery. The manna was a gift of an expression of God's grace. So was the quail. And God was graciously providing not, not the way that the Hebrew people wanted it. He provided, not, and sometimes we get those blessings, not the way we want them. But he knows what's best for us. God is still graciously, though, bringing exodus to our life. He still graciously satisfies our hunger. He still graciously feeds us the bread of life, which is Jesus himself. Grace is something completely unearned. Grace is something completely unmerited as we've looked as we as we studied these last several weeks in, in, in Ephesians. Thanksgiving is acknowledging that someone has given us something that we don't deserve. We don't it shouldn't be our due. Thanksgiving is recognizing that we've been give, giving something that's not onus, Otis. But you'll hear people say, well, hey, I'm a, I'm a decent sort of a guy. I mean, I, I'm a good moral citizen. I, I believe in God. I go to church periodically. I, I put some money in the offering. I pray when I think about it. Why shouldn't God shower me and recognize my spirit, you know, my life, and, and spiritually throw blessing upon my life. You know, we uh, as Americans are full of entitlement, aren't we? I mean, we are big on entitlement. We presuppose that God owes us something, or we presuppose that, that God is actually should be in our debt. But not so. God's goodness is never earned, or else it wouldn't be a blessing, it would be a barter. And in fact, sometimes God surprises us in that when we least deserve it, he pours out his gracious blessings on us. And an entitlement mentality seldom leads to thanksgiving. And you'll see that. If you see somebody who thinks that they are entitled, they aren't going to be very thankful people. When we think we've got it coming to us, What's there to be thankful for? Why not grumble? I mean, hey, when we don't receive things the way we think we deserve. Thankfulness, as veteran preacher and Bible teacher Warren Wiersbe once observed, he said, is the opposite of selfishness. See, the selfish person says, I deserve what comes to me. Other people, they ought, to, they ought to make me happy. Their position, their lot in life is to make me happy. The mature Christian realizes that life is a gift from God and that the blessings of life come only from God's bountiful hands. And so thanksgiving is a response to grace. Thanksgiving humbly acknowledges 
God, how good you are to me. How so awesomely good you are to me. Thanksgiving is responding to God's grace in the middle of trouble. Paul writes, he says, in everything, give thanks. He's not saying be thankful for everything. He's just saying that in every situation, give thanks to God who is in the situation. You give thanks for him. Give thanks when you, even the Amanda burgers are boring. But give thanks even when you're tired of roasted quail. Give thanks when Egypt tempts you to return. Give thanks when the waters of Mara and in the desert of sin, give, give thanks because God's grace, even in the midst of, of trouble, is present. Give thanks. Thanksgiving is a response to grace. I had a, finished preaching a sermon one time some years ago, and, and uh, someone asked me, Well, preacher, how, how do you live up to your own preaching? And I had to respond honestly. I don't always. And here's a case in point. Like many of you this week, I am going to count my blessings. Count them again for the tremendous blessings that life, the life that we've been blessed with. So many blessings we have. But there are times... I've taken God's blessings for granted. There are times when I forget and I relapse into grumbling. There are times when I forget it's, it, you know, it, it's a gift of grace. There are times when I forget what God has done for me through Jesus Christ. Yeah. How about you? How about you? Avery Brooke offers a straightforward prayer. She said, you know, I have many things, things to be thankful for, God. Sometimes I remember them and other times I forget. And when something large or small goes wrong, it fills my mind and I forget those things for which, when I remember, I am thankful. Help me to remember the good things, God. To name them and savor them and to be thankful to you for them. This morning, we want to offer an invitation. We're going to be using hymn 596, I Surrender All. We offer an invitation this morning to give you that opportunity to say thanks to God. See, when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, when we repent of our sin, when we are obedient to the Lord's command to be buried in a water grave, the water grave of Christian baptism, we are responding to God's grace for saving our soul. And we're saying, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you for giving to me a life that's abundant. If you've never done this, we want to give you that chance to do that this day. And you just step out as we stand, as we sing, I surrender all. Won't you surrender to him today?
thank you all for your presence and participation in our service today. And thank you. I am so grateful for uh, Westside Christian Church. I'm thankful for you all and uh, your encouragement, your help, your support, your efforts to try to take the gospel beyond these four walls to our community and to the world around us. Thank you for your prayer support. That means so, so very much. Please don't forget the announcements that are on the, on the screen that will be playing here in just the next few moments. And there it is. And we're not going to be having Wednesday Bible study this week due to the Thanksgiving holiday and everybody traveling to be with their family and friends. So enjoy that time together and uh, be, be, be safe. And then uh, there's the others that are, that are there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for giving us the example of your scriptures and your word and, and Father, to show us how we need to live, how we need not to be. But Father, help us to not be forgetful and grumble and forgive us for when we do. We repent of it, Lord. We want to change. We don't want to be grumblers. But Lord, we want to be thankful people and we want to have uh, hearts that are full of gratitude for your grace and your mercy that's been so richly poured upon us. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as a people be constantly reminded of that, to be thankful. Thankful of the nation that we are blessed to live in. Thankful of uh, the church that we're a part of. Thankful, Father, for our families. We just pray, Lord, that in all things that we would be show, show gratitude and and bring glory and honor to your holy name. We pray that you'll go with us now as we leave this place. Dismiss us as we leave in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Have a great day and happy Thanksgiving. All right, so uh, nice job dropping a bomb, hinting on whatever you were going to do that was interesting for Thanksgiving.